Amen. Thank you, choir. Welcome to church this morning. Hope you all have had a good morning so far. We've had a great day here so far. Our 845 service was good. And then our 10 o'clock service, we honored all our seniors who were graduating from high school. And uh, we had, I don't know, 15 or 16 young people up here, and we prayed over them, and it was a really good day. Well, my name's Kurt. We're glad that you're here. Let me open us with a word of prayer. God, this morning, we're so thankful for everything you do for us. And God, I'm thankful for the fact that you allow us to gather together and worship you. And I'm thankful for this church family and the, the people who, who sacrifice and serve to make this ministry possible so we can have a place where we can connect with other people and a place where we can connect with you as well. God, we thank you for all the answered prayers from the past week. And God, we pray for those today who maybe aren't here because they're under the weather, or they're sick, or they weren't able to get here. We pray for them that you'll bless them and keep them and be with them this morning as well. God, be with our pastor as he brings a message. Bring with the, the choir as they lead us in worship. And God, today we just come here to pause and say we love you. And thankful th we're thankful for you being a good God and a good father to us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We will start with our opening hymn, which is O Spirit of the Living God, on page 539 in your hymnal. We'll sing verses 1 through 3, so please stand and join us in song. O Spirit of the Now let us continue our worship as we affirm our faith together. Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
A couple things I want to put on your radar by way of announcements before we continue. First of all, his Vacation Bible School is right around the corner coming up really soon. And if you would like to sign up to serve at Vacation Bible School, or if you have kids or grandkids you want to sign up, you can do that at the tables in the lobby. There's a sign-up sheet. Feel free to put your name and phone number or email address on that. And Miss Maddie will get a hold of you this week on how you can get plugged in to serve. Also in July, we're, the second week of July, we're doing a family mission week to where every day that week and evening that week, we're doing a local mission project in the community to serve people, uh, whether we're building wheelchair ramps or feeding some people, doing some cleanup for people. Um, if you'd like to be a part of that or get more information on that, you can sign up on that same table as well. There's a sheet for that. Well, if you'd like to give your tithes and offerings, you can do so by dropping them in the buckets on your way out. Or you can go to our website, templeonline.org, click the Give button, and a safe and secure form will pop up where you can give your tithes and offerings. It's a great way and a convenient way to give your tithes and offerings. Well, as I said earlier today at our 10 o'clock service, we celebrated our seniors that are graduating high school, and they, there's just a whole bunch of them up here, and they're all going to college, and they all, I mean, we have a good-looking group of teenagers headed out of here to go to college, and a lot of them grew up in this church. Some even started the, school, at the church when they were in the day school, and today they were graduating. It was a beautiful thing to see. We celebrate that. So let's pray for those seniors, and then we'll continue in the worship service. God, this morning, I thank you for all the young people that were up here and they're graduating high school this week. God, I thank you for the students that are graduating high school who all over the city. But God, I pray that you will do a work in them. God, I pray that you give them an anointing. I pray that you fill them with your spirit as they love you and they've grown up in church. And now as they're going out to college or the real world, God, I pray that they will be an ambassador for you. God, I pray that they will be world changers and difference makers in the lives of people that they come across. God, I pray that your light will shine bright through these students that are graduating high school this year. God, I pray for their lives as they go on into college or work as they start thinking about a spouse and settling down and eventually starting a family, God, we pray blessings, all kinds of blessings on those teenagers. And God, I pray for their families. I pray for their moms and dads who are having a kid graduate because sometimes that's emotional and sad and it's, it's, a, it's a change in their life as well. God, I pray that you're present in their home and in their hearts and you help comfort them through this change in life as they're saying goodbye to their kids who are going off to college next year. God, we love you. I thank you for a church that takes seriously its ministry to teenagers. I thank you for Miss M and our youth department. God, I thank you for how many teenagers come on Wednesday nights and they're taught about you. And they're taught about real life issues and what you say about them. God, we're thankful for that. I'm thankful for a church that's generous in their giving so we can have a youth ministry and we have students and we can raise them up in your word. God, we thank you today for your son and what he did on the cross for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Through the eyes of men it seems there's so much we have lost as we look down the road where all the prodigals have walked and one by one the enemy has whispered lies and let them off as slaves but we know that you are god yours is the victory and we know there is more to come that we may not yet see. So by the Spirit, breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save. Yeah. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. As we call to dead hearts come alive come alive up out of the ashes let us see an army rise oh we call out to dry bones come alive Ooh. oh god of endless 
endless mercies, God of unrelenting love. Come rescue every daughter, bring us back the wayward sons. And by your spirit, breathe upon them, show the world that you alone can save. Oh, you alone can save. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. As we call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. About of the ashes, let us see an army rise. As we call out to dry bones, God, now breathe, O oh breath of God, breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe. Come breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe, O oh breath of God, breathe, O oh breath of God, now breathe. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. As we call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. The bone of the ashes, let us see an army rise. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, yes. As we call out to dry bones, Oh, come alive. Oh, come alive. I think she deserved another round of applause. That was beautiful. All right, now we're going to sing Surely the Presence of the Lord on page 328 in our hymnal. So please stand and join us in song. Thank you so much. What a powerful message from Ezekiel. Dry bones, Ezekiel and the dry bones, a beautiful message contained in that song, wasn't it? Amen? Amen. Amen. I got just powerful, powerful. That's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a signal to our spirit to come alive again in him. So let's go before the Lord and let's thank him for all that he's done. And let's give him praise and glory. And let's ask him for us, for our bones, for who we are, our spirit, to be revived and come alive again. Let's pray together. Father God, we, we come before you. We know, God, that you are the God of all comfort, the God of, and the Father of compassion. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you call us out to come alive. You call us out, Lord, from where we have been, from the valley of dry bones, from the, the valley of desperation and struggle and pain. 
and you call us into this new life. And so, Lord, we surrender. We surrender. And we open ourselves to what you want to do in our lives. We thank you, O God, because we know you are the author of life. You've given us everything that we have, and you've provided in ways that we've never even imagined. You've opened doors of opportunity, and you've showered us with your grace and love. And most especially, we thank you for Jesus, who without him, we would be lost. So we thank you for our salvation. And we glorify your name today because you are the one who is worthy of it all. And so, Lord, as we come before you, we come as imperfect people, but we come before a perfect God, ushered into your presence by your Son. And by his blood, we ask in his name for these things. We pray for our neighbors and our friends and our family members who are sick today, those who are hurting and in the hospital, those who are going through pain and grief. We ask that you would comfort them and heal them in your mighty name. We pray, Lord God, for those who feel left behind, left out, for those who feel forgotten. Lord, that you would surround them with your great love this morning. Father, we thank you for our, our family. We pray for children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren even. We thank you, Lord, that you, your promise is true and it can be trusted. For you said that I bless to the third and the fourth generation. And so we bless our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren today. We thank you for them. We ask, O oh God, that you would be with those in authority over us for our president and for Congress, Lord, for our governor and our county judge, and for the mayors of the various places where we reside. Give them wisdom and strength to be able to do what they need to do, to raise up a people whose God is the Lord. And so thank you, Father. And as we come before you, we, we come before you with a a hesitancy sometimes because we don't know how to pray. But Lord, teach us to pray. Like you taught your disciples, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen
I'm Emily. I'm the youth director here at the church, and I'm super proud to introduce Yelena, who is one of our youth. Um, so with this series, Life is a Beach, um, it's been quite a year for everybody, and it just speaks to different people in different ways. Um, but this kiddo has um, a really neat story to tell, and so um, why don't you catch us up? What what has this year been like for you? Um, it's been a pretty hard year. Um, okay, so it all started, my story starts from when we evacuated for Hurricane Laura and we found out my dad tested positive for COVID. And around one in the morning, my dad like started having trouble breathing and went and told my stepmom, um, you need to take me to the hospital in Houston, I can't breathe. And so my stepmom drove him to Houston and then went to Methodist Hospital. We would literally get bad updates and then good updates. Yeah. And it, it was a roller coaster yes. of like emotions. And I told the doctor told us it was a time like to say our goodbyes and stuff. So I told them everything I wanted to say. And uh, I had a few laughs and cries, but had that time. And then at 5.08, my whole, like a bunch of my family members came in there. We were all holding hands and uh, the doctor turned off the machine. So he was, we all had our time and we said our words we wanted to say and we prayed. And when we prayed, I felt like this voice in the back of my head saying, it's going to be okay. And so I like got chills down my spine and I was like, and from like the past youth events we've been to, like Miss Emily's even said it to me, like when you get a chill down your spine, like it's God with you. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, okay, like it's going to be okay. So I always kept that in my mind. So I knew it was going to be okay from there. And uh, he passed away at 508 on November 8th. So that was like a whole crazy journey from August to November. So I remember um, the night before the funeral. Yes. Which the funeral was taking place here. Yes. Um, oh, it was a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. And you called, like, I think you texted me from yeah. school, or maybe you didn't even go to school that day. I don't think I was. And you were like, hey, Miss Sam, are you free? I'm going to come by. And so we just talked through, like, you sat in my office and we talked yes. through, like, a thousand different things yeah. and all the emotions and feeling all those emotions as they come and they're healthy. And it's not weird to be mad and it's not weird to be happy in the next minute. Yeah. And, like just feel all the emotions as they come. But then you were like, hey, I don't think I can come to youth tonight. Like, I just, I don't think I'm ready. Yeah. And this girl here, like, um, since she's been a freshman, um, I don't think she's ever missed a Wednesday night. So that was like really like a profound yeah. thing for you. You were like, I don't know if I can do it. Yeah. And so we're rolling along and all this and then <laughs> We were in high school small group, and who comes walking through the door? I came through the this door, one. and because I was in Bridge City getting funeral stuff planned out, and I remember I was literally just sitting with all my family members, and I was like, I have to go, y'all. And they're like, Where you go? And I was like, The church, like, youth's going on, and I was like, I just can't miss it. And I was like, And I need to talk to Miss Emily, and I need to see like my, my friends, people. yeah, my friends, and like have a normal day before I go into like these hard few days like of the services and I remember like walking in the church and I was like like oh my god like this is where I'm gonna be tomorrow to like you know celebrate my dad's life or whatever and I but I walked in and I felt like peace coming in when I walked in the youth room it was so hard for me not to come on a Wednesday like even though I was mad at God like I don't know this place just brings me so much comfort and peace yeah. and I've literally grew up in this church like since I was a baby I was baptized here like it's my home yeah. And I couldn't. And no, that's what you told yeah. me in that moment. Like, yeah. I'm trying to keep it together. And yeah. you're like, it's my home. Yeah, it's my home. So it's really been <laughs> interesting to, like, look back over your story and be able to see, like, how you never became disconnected. Yeah. Um, even though church and God, it was an in and out emotion. Mm -hmm. And it was, like, really hard. Um, you found a way to plug in in a space that was really hard for you. Yeah. So tell us about that. Um, well, after my dad passed, well, before like my dad, when my dad was getting sick and everything, I contacted Maddie and I was like, hey, like if you have any openings at the nursery, I would love to like apply and, you know, try to work there. And she was like, yeah, for sure. Like just come pick up an application. So I had an application and then my dad passed away and I was telling my mom, I had a whole talk with her. I was like, I don't think I can work here. Like come every Sunday or Wednesday and be at the place where my dad had his funeral. And I, I was like, I just can't do it. So I prayed over it and I prayed over it. And I was like, okay, this is a way you can connect and still be in the church, but not go in the sanctuary. Cause 
I haven't been in the sanctuary. Last Sunday was actually my first Sunday since my dad passed away to go into the sanctuary since the funeral. And uh, it's been so hard for me to like, even just walk in the sanctuary because I just smell this smell. Like I remember the smell and everything of that day, like all the senses just came to me and I was like, I can't do this. But working in the church nursery has been like so good for me because I'm still plugged in to the church because I didn't want to like, you know, get the church out of my life. Like I could not do that. Just throw it all away of everything. I've grown up here and everything. So I was like, okay, I can't do that. So, but I got to work at the nursery and I love it still to this day. Like I love the little kids working with them and I'm glad that I can still come to the church on Wednesdays and Sundays and, you know, find something to do without like having to pressure myself to go into the sanctuary just yet. Yeah. So, so what is, um, so like, what does today look like? Like where, like what led us to this point where you're like telling us this story and um, um that I have a lot of prayer a lot of prayer um let's see I've grown a lot since then because I remember I shut off kind of from everyone like when my dad was sick and when he passed away I kind of like flipped the switch kind of and I was like not talking to anyone I was like depressed and everything and um just, I realized it's not worth it to be sad every day when, like, I know that my dad's so happy right now, and it's, and my dad was a guy that, like, always never, he never wanted me to be sad, and he, I know, like, to this day, like, several people have asked me, like, what would your dad say to this day to you? He would be like, don't worry, I'm fine, don't be sad, go live your life, and my dad always told us, like, live life to the fullest, like, and so when my dad passed away, it was like really an eye opener because COVID was still going on and all that. And I was like, this, this virus isn't like a joke. Like, you know, like we weren't too serious about it then, but when it affected our family, we were like, okay. So I realized like live life to the fullest, like do the things you want to do in life. Like don't, don't hold back just because you're sad. Like I still have good and bad days. Like I have some days where I break down and I miss my dad. I miss him every day. I think of him every day, but, uh, I think like prayer and like, I can sometimes like feel my dad like with me and I can feel him with me right now, like the spirit with him. So I think that's what's got me to this point. Like just holding on to my faith and trying to get it back up to where it was every day. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think that like just sitting here and telling your story um, and being part of your journey through this and being like intertwined through all the yeah. emotions and all the talks and and all the life mm -hmm. that we've kind of lived together over this last year yeah um that your dad is looking down on you and he is super proud and i'm super proud Thank and you. i know um <laughs> many of you know yelena you've watched her grow up <laughs> but some of you may not know her but um but just let this story um just be a lesson to you that like every day is a gift. Um, and even whenever times are hard and life is a beach, um, yeah. God's there through it, like yeah. through the hard stuff, through the good stuff, um, celebrate the highs and be faithful through the lows. Yeah, for sure. Man, let's give God thanks for that. Isn't that a powerful? Powerful, powerful testimony Yelena gave, and um, I just want us to take a moment now and, and pray for her and her family with the loss of her dad. Obviously, they're going through the grief and still going through grief, and they're, you don't ever get over it, but you get through it. And so, we want to let's pray for their family right now. Father, we just thank you for Yelena and her her courage uh, to be able to come up and and, and talk about this on camera. Um, we thank you, Lord, that you've worked in her and through her in such a powerful way and we thank you oh God that that we can take some things from what she has learned and be reminded that you are the God of all comfort so comfort her right now and that whole family and bring them the peace that they need in Jesus name we pray and all God's people said amen what do you think of when you think of the word beach sand oh there you go yeah I don't know what you all think of. I'm sure we all have differences of what we think of. Maybe you think of family memories and exciting times on vacation together or something like that. 
Maybe you think of, uh, if you're part of a, a bit of a paler skin, uh, you think of sunburns and uh, salty water and sand in places where you didn't know you had places. The first time I ever saw the beach, I was 15 years old, and I, we went to St. Simons Island, Georgia. I was from Kentucky. We went to St. Simon, Simons Island, Georgia on a youth trip. And when we were there, we, we all went down to the beach and the, and the rest of the youth were on the, on the beach. And I went out into the water and I got out there and I was about waist deep in the water. And I was looking kind of towards the beach with my back to the ocean and looking down at the water. I'd never been in one of these, the, the, in one of these oceans. I'd never been in an ocean. I'd, never, I'd only been in a swimming pool. I didn't understand the whole sand under your feet thing and the rocks and all that and I was kind of just looking around and, and everything like that. Our, we didn't go to the beach on vacation. We, uh, we went to the second best destination, uh, Nebraska. Uh, that's where we went on vacation. Yeah, that's the second greatest uh, yeah, place to go on vacation. But that's where my dad's family's from. But, so this is the first time at the beach and I'm standing there and I'm enjoying myself and I'm thinking this is great. All of a sudden I hear my friends yell my name and I look up and they go wave and so I went <laughs> and they're like wave and I'm like <laughs> did a Nixon you know that kind of thing all right and they're like no stupid wave and just about that time I turned around and this giant wave hits me in the face and knocks me under the water. And I'm desperately trying to get to the surface of the water. And I am, I am fighting with everything. And, and I've never been in salt water before, so by, the salt water is, is burning my eyes, it's burning my lungs, uh, and I start to panic. And, and so I try my best, I'm trying with everything I can, and there was this moment where I was under the water and I was screaming, but nobody was hearing me. It was eerie. It was a moment of quiet desperation. Quiet desperation. And then all of a sudden, I could see the light on the surface, and I could see myself going up to the surface and, and where I could come up for air and, and, and catch my breath again. And quickly, my, my moment of quiet desperation was replaced by a moment of hopeful anticipation and my hope for this series and for this message today for you is this that God will replace our quiet desperation with hopeful anticipation because I have a feeling that many of us in this room may feel like we have lived through a season in this past year of quiet desperation you know I, when I was underwater I couldn't control what the currents were doing that took me under and that's true in life we can't control the currents that come against us there's so many things in our life we can't control we can't control even though we really try we can't control the aging process can we we can't control what happens with the economy or what happens sometimes with our job we can't always control what people say or what people think or what people do. We can't control uh, oftentimes what happens with our health. And we, quite frankly, can't control what happens to us most of the time. And when we can't control something, that's when we panic. And when we panic, we do the thing that we know how to do which is try harder we just try our best we just try to keep going we just we just you know put the pedal to the metal and and put more gas on it and we go after it and and that actually can be the worst thing that we can do because that's when we get into trouble we get exhausted we get burned out we get blown out and we find ourselves using all of our energy trying to fix something that we can't control. Have you been in that season of quiet desperation trying to control something that quite frankly you can't control? You know th this, this season of current after current coming at us has taken its toll on our society. According to the 
Kaiser Foundation, in a recent survey, one out of two Americans are dealing with one form of significant emotional or mental issue. One out of two. One out of four young people. We're talking college age and teenagers and even younger have considered taking their own life in the past year. But into this quiet desperation, God in his word comes to give us hopeful anticipation, to give us our breath back, to give us some air, to come up for some relief. So I invite you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul is writing, as we said last week, to the church in Corinth that he founded. It's a church that's been through a lot of problems. Paul's been there to visit because there were so many problems. He's written a letter. He's actually written three or four letters. This is the second one that we actually have found. And he writes this letter and he shares his heart about all of the struggles he has had and the trouble that he has had. And in this, Paul gives us some some lessons that we can all learn. Because he's teaching this, this young church how to catch your breath in a time of trouble. And the first thing that we learn in, in 2 Corinthians is, is this, to catch your breath, have confidence in God's comfort. You know, we kind of have to ask ourselves, what in the world does that actually mean? To have confidence in God's comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of what? All comfort. All comfort. Who comforts us in what? All our troubles. Now last week, if you were with us, we talked about the word comfort. It's actually two words. It means soothing and strengthening when God gives us his comfort he's coming alongside us and he's not only soothing us he's strengthening us for the days ahead when he gives us his comfort what he's actually doing is not just making us feel better he's actually making us feel stronger and we talked about that word trouble and we said that there's lots of definitions for trouble every single one of us would have a definition of trouble that would be different than the other person but there's one word that identifies trouble that defines trouble for us and that's the word pressure we all know what it's like to have pressure we see pressure all over our world today economic pressure political upheaval social unrest all of these things are a representative of pressure but there's a little word that we skipped over last week that I want to go back to it's a word that we read and we kind of move on, we don't even think about it. It's a little three-letter word, all. A-L-L, all. Paul says he's the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. That's a strange way to say it, isn't it? Like, we wouldn't say it that way, would we? We would say God is the God of comfort who comforts us in our troubles. But Paul says he's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles. Why why does he emphasize that? Why does he make a point about all our troubles, all of his comfort? Because he's wanting to make the point, I believe, that all of God's comfort is available for all of your troubles. All. It's available for all. You know... It's, it's interesting. It's, it's not like some of God's comfort is available for some of your troubles. Or all of God's comfort is available for some of your troubles. I'll give you an example. We had some problems at our house with the internet. We were, my wife works from home, and so she uses the internet all the time for her meetings and, and everything. And sometimes I'm working from the house and, and writing messages and such, being up at night and doing different things. And uh, I work all kinds of weird hours. I sleep like four hours a night. But it's kind of, <laughs> that's just the, the way I'm wired. And so, I, and, and we were, our internet was going down all the time. It was, it was always down. It was always really slow. We were always having problems with it. And so, I, I learned one lesson from my dad, and that is 
uh, not just rubbing dirt in a wound, but, th- but he also said, happy wife, happy life. Amen? That's a good place for the men to say amen. I mean, I'm giving you points. I'm setting that, I'm setting that golf ball right there, teeing it up for you to, to get some, some, some good points right there. But happy wife, happy life. And so I said, okay, we're going to switch providers. So we switched our providers, and I had this equipment. I had to return to the Internet provider, and I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where their office was. And so I finally called their customer service line, and I said, hey, where's your retail store that I can return this equipment to? And they said, oh, well, we can't help you with that. Now, if you've got a problem with your Internet, we can help you. But we can't tell you where the store is. And I said, so let me get this straight. You can help me with the connectivity, but you can't tell me where your store is? They said, that's right. For that, you're on your own. And I, to which I said, now I understand why you are my former internet provider. But you know, sometimes I've thought about God that way. Like, you're on your own on that one. For that trouble, you're on your own. I mean, God will help me on some of the things, but he's not going to help me on the big things. Or sometimes we think God's going to help us on the, the big things, but he's not going to help us on something real little. And he's especially not going to help us on the troubles that we bring on ourselves, the stuff we're responsible for, the stuff that we caused. But Paul says, no, 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 no. He's the God of all comfort. For all our troubles. There's no asterisk. There's no exception. He says all our trouble. Now, that sounds really, really nice. But the problem is, how does he do that? How how does he, okay, I get it. He's the God of all comfort for all my troubles. That's great, Phil. Let's go home and eat roast beef. But how does he do it? Let me give you an example. If you, if you know someone who has severe asthma, they will tell you that they are comforted and confident when they have their inhaler in their pocket. Because in, when they have it in their, in their pocket, they know that, that, that they're not worried about having an attack. And in fact, the chances of an attack are actually less when they have it with them. And the opposite is true. When they don't have it, they're worried, they're concerned, they're uncomfortable, and they oftentimes can bring on an attack. And the same thing is true with God's comfort. When we have it, when we're confident in his comfort, we have it with us, and we know that we're going to be okay. So my question for you is, are you confident in God's comfort, what do you have in your pocket? What are you carrying around in your pocket? Do you have God? Do you have confidence in God's comfort for all of your troubles? Or are there troubles that you said, "Well, He's not going to help me with that. He can help me with these things, but n- not over here." Paul says He's the God of all comfort for all of our troubles. See, when we're confident in his comfort and that his comfort is available for all of our troubles, that makes all the difference in the world. Because Paul says that it's available to us when we put our hope in the Lord Jesus. When we put our confidence in him and we surrender to him and we say yes to him, then what that means is is that we have confidence in his comfort, that his comfort is with us. So first, to catch our breath, we need to have confidence in his comfort. But the second thing we need to do is number two to catch our breath we need to remember we're not alone Paul teaches us this in 2nd Corinthians you know what amazes me about 2nd Corinthians is how incredibly vulnerable Paul is throughout the letter he lays it all out there he tells about his struggles his troubles his issues his problems and he he's not just using the past tense folks he's using the present tense You know, sometimes people will tell you about their problems, but they are talking about something that happened 20 years ago, but they won't ever tell you about what they're going through right now. Well, Paul very honestly says, hey, I'm going through this. I'm struggling with this. I've got this issue. 
And isn't it refreshing when we know that somebody is struggling with something that we're struggling with? Isn't it, isn't it, doesn't it do something? Doesn't it give us some air? Doesn't it get, it causes us to catch our breath when we, when someone testifies about what they're going through and that they have been through the same season in life that we are going through presently? I mean, when someone shares their story like Yelena did, there's a part of us that goes, they get it. They understand what I'm going through. I'm not alone in this. And even though it's heart-wrenching, you recognize that you're not by yourself. That God is with you. He's the God of all comfort. Because there may be people today who are here who are thinking, well, I'm struggling through this and I'm the only one I'm the only one who struggled with this. Well, that's not true. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon said. Well, I'm the only one who struggled with it this hard. No. There are people who struggle with it just as hard as you have. Well, other people may have gotten through it, but I won't get through it. No. He's the God of all comfort. A lot of times we think that we're completely alone. But we need to remember that there are people in this room, people on your row, people in front of you, and people behind you who have been through the exact season that you're going through right now. They know what it's like to wait for the results of a test on a Tuesday from the doctor. They know what it's like to be diagnosed with cancer. They know what it's like to go through financial vulnerability job loss. They know what it's like to go through a time when you're not certain about whether your kids are going to straighten up and go right or go in the wrong direction. They know what it's like to go through the problems of aging and issues of, of, of health and all of these things. They know what it's like. You're not alone. And one of the devices, one of the tricks that Satan loves to pull and what he's pulled in this whole COVID mess is to isolate us from each other so that we won't hear each other's story, so we won't hear Yelena's story, so we won't hear what other people are going through. So why? To convince ourselves that we are alone in this big, bad world that we live in. But when you hear other people tell their story, when you get to know them, when you connect to them, they testify to the fact that God's a God of comfort that he comforts us in all of our troubles, that there's nothing that he cannot comfort us in. See, there are people here today, you need to know, there are people who've walked your journey. They've walked through your season. They've walked through the valley of the shadow of death, and today they fear no evil because they are confident in the comfort of God. They know that they know that they know that God is with them all of his comfort for all of your troubles. That's why Paul writes about it in 2 Corinthians. He writes about trouble. You know, one of the things I really can't stand are people who give you advice about things that they've never done. That drives me crazy. People say, oh, I can give you three steps to handle this, and they've never been through it themselves. Well, that's not the case with Paul. In 2 Corinthians, Paul has been through it. Paul understands it. Paul isn't sitting there pontificating in the faculty lounge about some theory, right? That he came up with his, you know, master's thesis. No, Paul has had a PhD in life. He's learned it. He's been through it. He's been through the issues. He says, I've been beaten. I was beaten with, beaten 39 times. I was beaten with rods. I was left for dead multiple times. I've been hungry. I've been thirsty. I've been shipwrecked. I've been set out to sea and adrift. He's been through it. He even says he has a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. People speculate it all the time. He doesn't reveal what it is, but he says that every time that he's gone through it, God has told Paul, My grace, my comfort is sufficient for you. 
For my strength is perfect in your weakness. What does that mean? That means God comes alongside our weakness and he gives us his comfort. He soothes us. He strengthens us. And he helps us to get what we need to get through the season that we're in. It's kind of it's kind of like this. The Bible says he's, he's, his grace, his comfort is sufficient for us. Sufficient means that always enough. It's kind of like a spoon. Uh, you know, God's comfort is like a spoon. So if you have a bad day, not a horrible day, but a bad day, God gives you a teaspoon of his comfort. Because that's what you need that day. But some days are really, really bad. Some days are really, really horrible. And, and you don't need a teaspoon. You need a tablespoon. And then there are other days, and we've all been through it, where all of the pressures of life, it seems like an entire season is packed into a 24-hour period. All of the trouble, all the pressure seems to happen on a single day, and that's when God backs up a dump truck load of comfort into our life. See, it's always sufficient for what we need. It's always sufficient for what we need. All of his comfort for all that we, all of our trouble. I was reading some statistics on mental health, and the statistics show that over the last year that Americans have had a decline, a mental health decline of 12%, 12 percentage points, negative 12 on average. And I think we see, I think we see that. I think we see evidence of that all over the place, don't we? But what was interesting is that there is one outlier, one factor that actually a group that completely was different than all of the rest of Americans. One group had one thing in common. And their mental health increased by 4%. It didn't go down by 12. And they had one factor in common. It wasn't age, it wasn't race, it wasn't income. You know what it was? Something simple. Gallup reports that it was weekly church attendance. Isn't that interesting? For those people who attend church weekly, not monthly, not every once in a while, but weekly, over the last year, mental health has actually grown by 4%. I don't, we, we wonder why that is, but I think I have an idea. I think it's an indication of where we put our confidence, where we put our hope. Because when we put our hope in the Lord, and when we commit to his church, that's the difference maker. And so I always tell people, and I think this is important, keep showing up. Keep showing up. Because when you show up, you say, well, what does it matter? Let me tell you what matters. When you show up, God reminds you of, uh, to have confidence and he strengthens your confidence in his comfort. And the second thing that he does, when you hear each other's stories and when you get connected to each other and you share about your life together, you are reminded that you're not alone. You're reminded that you're not alone. I want to close with Psalm 34, verse 18. And I want to read to you in the message version. It's, I think the message says something kind of interesting. They say it in a way that's very plain spoken. It says, if your heart is broken, you'll find God right there. If you're kicked in the gut, he'll help you catch your breath. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you are the God of all comfort and the Father of compassion. We thank you, Lord God, that no matter what we are going through, that all of your comfort is available for all of our troubles. But Lord, first of all, we must put our hope and our confidence in you. And so today, Lord, we just bow before you again and we say, God, we place our hope, we place our confidence in you. For all around a sinking sand, you are the only rock. Just like the old song says, Father, we've seen it this week. 
We've seen job numbers and we've seen of the economy and we've seen the stock market. We've seen weather. All around us is sinking sand, Lord. And you are the rock upon which we find our hope. So we place our hope and our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and let us conclude with our closing hymn? We will sing Spirit Song on page 347. No, go as his lamb. Go as the one who he died for. Go in the name of the only God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to live, love, and learn in his name. Amen. Amen.